Hello, I'm Jim Paxson. You know, learning a little something new is good for everyone. So tonight we'll go to the Phoenix Zoo where turtles are at the head of their class. You'll also see some teachers getting a lesson in Mexican wolves and then we'll go up north to learn the simplest way to keep wildlife wild. All that and more coming up on Arizona Wildlife Views. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Good evening and welcome to our show. Our first story tonight should get you out of your shell as we take you along on an annual expedition to help conserve Arizona's native turtles. Good morning. I'm with Game and Fish. We're out trapping turtles this weekend. We've got a turtle in a trap over here, folks, if you want to take a look. How come? Yeah. You said, oh, these are invasive species. So these actually started out as people's pets. At pet stores, they were tiny. Uh -huh. People can't take care of them after a couple of years, and unfortunately, they get dumped here. I think that's a cooter, yellow belly cooter. Most of them are red-eared sliders yeah, or pond sliders. Exactly. We're catching any and all we can this weekend. They're all non-native. Yeah. So um, the concern is that if we leave breeding females in here, the numbers, they keep growing, mm -hmm. and then they could get into um, other waterways, Tempe Town Lake, Salt River, and then they could outcompete the uh, native species. Yeah. So, last year we took out 200 in three days, just out, wow. just out of this little tiny pond, yeah. We are in officially Papago Park Pond number four. It's owned by the city of Phoenix, but it is a what we can, we conveniently call the moat, and it separates the Phoenix Zoo parking lot from the Phoenix Zoo. Uh, today we're conducting our ninth turtle trapping at the Phoenix Zoo in an effort to uh, remove non-native turtles from these waterways, to keep them from breeding and then moving out to other waterways. Oh, I think they have a turtle, at least one in here. So it's a red-eared slider, it's also called a pond slider, um, and it's the most widely distributed turtle in the world. Um, they're native to the eastern United States, but um, they have been introduced even as far as Asia. And they're the, what was commonly called the dime store turtle back in the 50s. Um, people would buy them with a little aquarium and a little plastic palm tree, um, and they're still quite popular in the pet trade today. And you know, people buy them when they're cute and they're little, and then they start outgrowing their tank, and people don't realize how much maintenance um, it actually is to take care of them. So, um, what's been happening is people have been dumping them in the pond. And this turtle probably was in captivity pretty recently. You've got a little bit of pyramiding, which is something we see in captive turtles, and also some peeling of the scutes. Another little red-eared slider. People bring turtles to this pond in particular because when you walk over the bridge into the zoo, you see nothing but turtles. And to the untrained eye, even to the trained eye, these turtles appear happy and healthy. And so if you have a turtle that has outgrown its uniqueness or its aquarium, or it's become stinkier and bitier as they, as they mature, uh, you want to get rid of it, but you want to you want to you want to free it somehow. Yeah. And so the Phoenix Zoo, this mode in particular, certainly seems to catch a lot of people's attention for that. But if you have a turtle you can no longer care for, re releasing it into the wild, while some may survive, uh, some may not. And so releasing a turtle here, uh, it may not be able to find the food uh, or even the shelter that it needs to to survive. Another red-eared slider. Another one that was probably pretty recently released from captivity based on the shell pyramiding. See the bumps on it? Since we first started this as, as the department partnering with the zoo, we've captured over 800 turtles and representing 17 species. 
Now, only one of those species is the native Sonora mud turtle, and we've only captured two individual Sonora mud turtles in all of our efforts. In an average year, I would say maybe 100, 125 turtles are captured. I know last year there was 100, the year before I think it may have been 98, and a couple years ago it was 150. Phoenix Turp is involved with game and fish doing these turtle trappings here at the zoo. We'll catch all the, all the turtles, separate out the males and females, mark the males, and release the males back into, into here. And then the females, I'll take up to the Phoenix Herpetological Sanctuary, and where we'll keep them to either live out their lives or we'll adopt them out. So your job today is to talk to people as they enter the zoo. There is no way we could do this without our volunteers. And we've done it with as few as 100 and as many as 175, and they actually make this event possible. It allows the department staff to focus on making sure that everybody has the proper messaging and making sure that the, that the traps, when they're set, are set in such a way that no turtles are harmed during the process. So we can focus on the actual management tasks uh, because we have such a tremendous volunteer base. Some of them are zoo volunteers, a lot of them are turtle project volunteers that have assisted us with other projects. Some of them only come out and do this project every year and they start asking me questions in March wanting to know when the date is so they can get it on their calendars. There you go, good job. Bryce? Walking across the zoo for years, you know, going into the zoo, you always kind of, you know, like, oh, I wish I could get down there and get this, you know, because there's always that one you spot that, oh, I'd love to have that, you know, there's a painted turtle out there. I would love to get that guy. You know, now I have the opportunity to go out there and you know capture them. They say a couple of years ago we pulled a 62-pound alligator snapper out of here. So in 2010, we were pulling out all of our traps at the end of the day, and so it was our last day. It was Sunday, and we counted the traps. We counted the traps. We counted the traps maybe six times. We went through and realized there was still one trap missing. And no matter how many times we counted, there was only 34, and we knew we had 35 traps set. So two of our volunteers, uh, one weighing about 100 pounds, the other one maybe 110 pounds, hopped into a boat and boldly went out on an adventure to see if they could figure out where that last trap was. And uh, it was an incredibly windy day. So they were, they were going in with a tailwind to, to the far western edge of the pond, where they saw a rope, just a rope, a taut rope, stretched out from a palm tree that went straight underwater. So they figured that could be our trap. So they went over to that trap and with all of their might, without tipping the boat, they managed to pull it up just enough to see that they had captured a very large alligator snapping turtle. He was so large that they couldn't, in fact, get the trap into the boat. And so they had to, one of them was rowing while the other one was holding with all of their might, this, what turned out to be 62 pound alligator snapping turtle in a hoop net on the edge of the boat as they paddled into a headwind that was quite, quite stiff. And so they, were, they, they brought it in. I heard, I heard a ruckus that came running back to the boat launch area to find them lifting this 62 pound alligator snapping turtle onto the flatbed of one of the zoo's carts. My son actually got to do that, you know, type thing, which was kind of really annoying that he got to pull it out and not me. And he hasn't let me live it down for years because I was supposed to go out on the boat, but I said, nah, Caleb, you go. So he went, so he got that. And we still have that up at the sanctuary, too. Oh, I think we got a turtle. Yeah, there's one in there. If you are interested in getting a pet turtle, you should first maybe go to a rescue agency and see if there is a turtle that already needs a home rather than purchasing one from the pet store because purchasing them from the pet store can lead to uh, more depletion of turtles from the wild and also more that get released unnecessarily into ponds like the one here. If you go to the turtle pages, which is the azgfd.gov slash turtle, we have a link to the Phoenix Herpetological Society on our pages. So on those pages you can learn how to care for captive native desert tortoises and you can also learn what to do with turtles that you are no longer interested in. How's it going? Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There's one up here. In this classroom, the students are actually a group of teachers attending a Focus Wild workshop sponsored by Arizona Game and Fish and held at the Phoenix Zoo. First of all, welcome. So this is the Wolves of the Southwest Teacher Workshop, Educator Workshop, in case you are thinking you're in the wrong spot. And our goal is to show teachers how they, can, how they can bring wildlife issues and the wildlife themselves into their classroom. And so we do a lot of ones that are more pedagogical from how do we teach 
wildlife concepts, looking at inquiry, looking at um, combining literacy and science. And then we do a lot of wildlife specific ones that might be hot topics of the day, like black footed ferrets or wolves or jaguars or whatever that might, whatever the topic might be that we can generate some interest in, what we would call a teachable moment. So let's talk about the wolves a little bit. Um, if you weren't familiar, we do have wolves in Arizona. We've had them. They are historically found in Arizona. We have the Mexican gray wolf. Um, it is largely considered a subspecies of the larger gray wolf, the timber wolf that's found in like Minnesota and the, and the Midwest area. Along with learning about the history of wolves in Arizona, the teachers also hear about the role zoos play in saving endangered species and the complexities involved when it comes to maintaining genetic diversity. We have to know the history because we have to know how this animal is represented within the breeding population. We also need to know, does this animal have genetic markers that would not be good to carry on within the population? You know, so we, we've got to know as much as possible. And so you can imagine Gretchen is our registrar. The nightmare job that she has of tracking every single animal in this zoo. Okay, every little bird, every turtle, <laughs> okay, everything that you see out there has a name, has a number, and an entire history behind it. So there's one individual who has to look at every single individual within the pop captive population and decide wolf A gets to breed with wolf X because they are not overly represented in the population. They're of prime breeding age. They seem to be of prime breeding health. And so they make that recommendation. The Phoenix Zoo currently has four Mexican wolves, all males, which have been involved in the conservation efforts for this species. This workshop is about more than just the nuts and bolts of wolf history and genetics. Back in the classroom, Eric uses a very familiar fairy tale to help illustrate how culture affects our perspectives, in this case, towards the wolf. Red Riding Hood, what is the distinctive garment that she wears? A red hood. A red hood? Does anybody think there's something else? A cape. A cape. A cape. So some people are saying a cape. Does the cape have a hood? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We had uh, teachers think back to Little Red Riding Hood when they were young and how they remember that story. And then what we did was we had them start to share those, the stories that they remember, and we started to recognize some differences sometimes in how it ended. Uh, was there a woodsman? Was there not a woodsman? How did the wood, what did the woodsman do when he got into the, into the house? Did he kill the wolf? Was the wolf um, chased away? All these different instances. And then we started talking about why there might be differences, and it really came down to culture. And then we could show them Little Red Riding stories from other cultures and show them that um, depending on where you were born and where you were raised often shapes your impression of the wildlife that you might be encountering in that area. Okay, so how does it end? What happens to the wolf? He goes out to way. He burns his mouth. Like, okay. Grandma beats him with a poker. Oh. Grandma beats him with a poker. Grandma, Grandma. so there's no, woods, there's no woodsman in this one? Mm -hmm. okay. It's amazing to think about how many different ways Little Red Riding Hood is, is told. And that's going to be an interesting thing. The school where I teach, we have a very mixed, multicultural environment and we get people from all over the world. And so it would be really great to bring that into my school and to get to hear how other people do view that story. Perspectives on the wolf are also shaped by the direct impact their presence has on the landscape where they live. To give the teachers a clearer understanding of the complexities of the issue, they heard from both a biologist who works with the wolves every day and a rancher who deals with the consequences of the wolf reintroduction. The primary prey of Mexican gray wolves are, are elk and deer within the Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area. The Blue Range Wolf Recovery Area is, uh, includes Arizona, New Mexico, and the White Mountain Reservation. The historical distribution, as you can see from the map here, was from central New Mexico and Arizona, western Texas, all the way down to the state of Mexico City and, uh, and the mountainous region of Mexico. Ranchers don't hate wolves. Just like we don't hate lions, we don't hate coyotes, but what we have because of our lifestyle and what we do and we our office is the woods. <laughs> our office, you know, are these these river valleys is we have basically a predictable adversarial relationship. We raise slow, not too intelligent animals. <laughs> and um, 
And so obviously we have concerns about animals that, that are top level predators being in the vicinity of the animals that we raise. On January 25th, 1998, they released the first wolves. I believe it was seven wolves in Arizona. At the end of 1998, I, uh, I, I think there were three or four left. Um, they were captive wolves. They'd been hand fed, you know, for so many years. They didn't have a lot of wild skills. They had a lot of nuisance behavior and they were pretty easy to shoot at that point. Not a lot of people were in favor of wolves in the area that they were released. So there was a, it was a, a long fight to get a population established just from the captive animals. If you asked a rancher anywhere in Arizona and said, do you think wolves should be reintroduced? They're going to say, no, <laughs> you know. Um, so, I mean, I don't just gonna be straightforward about that. However, with what's happening today, you know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Whether this population of wolves expands or it stays where it is, it's staying. Um, so so it, now it's a matter of, okay, well, how do we live with it? How do we manage for the situation? It's clear that the reintroduction of wolves is not a simple issue. So to create another teachable moment, Whatever, Eric divides the class in into groups, area. with each person taking on a role of a different stakeholder to see how they would tackle a similar situation. You're going to meet for about five minutes briefly in that group of about three or four people and just sort of outline what's important to you in this proposal. They had to, to, to meet together and sort of compromise and come up with a potential solution and give recommendations to the Game and Fish Department on what, whether we should pursue this reintroduction. And if we do, should there be stipulations that we should put in, regulations that we should put in, and really got them to see that, again, it's not a black and white issue. It's not as simple as just saying Game and Fish should do this. We know that there's a good prey population, we know that there's good road density, everything fits into that thing to follow along the lines to make sure that we can take this animal from the endangered list and take them off of that list without affecting too much. And Do they know this? <laughs> I mean, it's again, you know, breaking, the, they, don't, they don't follow the rules, they kill, they'll kill my rules. This is beef on a ranch that I guarantee that no predator has ever been killed because he's preying on my livestock. After a lot of lively discussion, each group presented their concern and recommendations for the proposed wolf reintroduction. The one who had the most trouble was a private landowner, not a rancher, just a private landowner, and her opinion was, it's my land, I should be able to do whatever I want on it. If a wolf comes onto my land, I should be able to do whatever I need to to either get rid of them or, you know, whatever, you know. Our um, ranchers, they were very vocal, very vocal <laughs> on the fact that they needed to have their livelihood protected. As a hunting community, we were <laughs> first kind of no. So after that, we come up with a compromise. We were big on compromises over here. We would like to compromise that we proceed with the project as planned. However, you at the Arizona Game and Fish Department <laughs> keep a sustainable level of deer and elk, which drives our economy as a hunting community. When And you also give an exact number of population of wolves. Once that population exceeds that number, we institute a hunting season, which then will boost our economy with hunting licenses on wolves. Everybody wins, we're all happy. We saw where those stakeholder groups coming together, we saw separate plans from separate groups coming out. So basically the same idea. We had the financial, it's been interesting how different groups have picked up on different things so far. Um, you know, we had some of the private property stuff, we've had some of the financial incentives, and now we've actually had some of the, some of the recreational pieces represented as well. I've always had an interest in wolves, and um, recently moving out here in the last six months, um, I noticed this wolf introduction, reintroduction program, and it kind of caught my attention. On top of that, I was looking for some other ways to, um, some other ways to teach science and to, and to introduce this and work this into a curriculum. I really enjoyed the class. I thought it was great that we got to hear from speakers who have actually been out there with the wolves and the pros and the cons of trying to save them and looking at it from different points of view, which is so important. That's what we have to be able to present to our kids because they need to know both points of view. Really what we wanted to show today is the different perspectives that come to the table when we're talking about any particular type of wildlife issue. In this case it was wolves and showing that it's not just cut and dry. I like to use the statement that wildlife biology is not the same as wildlife management and when we manage wildlife 
oftentimes we're managing the people as well, and so we need to acknowledge the perspectives. As a government agency, we're responsible for all the people and serving all of the people, and all those people come with different perspectives. The Mojave County Courthouse in Kingman, Arizona. Oh, and I don't know if people have been disturbing him or not, but... Game and Fish Wildlife Manager Lainey Antelik is here on a call about a possible no. injured owl. That is a baby, believe it or not. <laughs> As it turns out, the bird is not injured. It's a young, great horned owl that left its nest before completely mastering the art of flight. What happens is they fall from their nest when they're learning to fly, and the mom will still continue to feed them until they can fly and kind of be on their own, so. It probably would prefer to be back in the safety of its courthouse nest, but Antelix says the owl ought to be just fine as long as people leave it alone. Luckily, this story was a happy ending. It's just a, a healthy nestling that's learning to fly, and we'll leave him alone, and hopefully everything will turn out well. So. Responding to a call like this, protecting wild animals is one of the best parts of her job. Being forced to destroy them is the absolute worst. But it happens, and it's often the result of people feeding wildlife. It's a statewide problem, but in the Wallapai Mountains outside of Kingman, feeding wildlife is a serious concern. You come up here in the Wallapais and you're in the pines and you're surrounded by wildlife just within 15 minutes drive time of Kingman. And there's a small community that lives up here as well. So people have homes up here, they have summer homes. Some people live here year round, but we get a lot of visitors up here as well. People come up here all the time, in fact, to view elk and deer close and, and personal. The reason those animals are coming into this area, and there seems to be so many of them, is because people are feeding them. We have the beautiful Wallapai Mountains, but it's kind of an ugly issue that goes on here. It goes on everywhere, but in Maricopa and Pima counties, it's illegal to feed wildlife except for birds and squirrels. For the rest of Arizona, feeding wildlife is not against the law. Granted, it's not illegal in Mojave County, but it's not good for the animal in the long run. Again, it's not part of their natural diet. There are actually quite a few people in this community that uh, put out hay bales, and they put out big troughs of water to bring the elk into their yard. And you'll see there'll be 20 elk bedded down in their yard. They just kind of hang out with little motivation to roam and forage like wild animals normally do. And when wildlife get used to people, they're more likely to get into trouble. Twice in two weeks, game and fish had to tranquilize elk to remove trash can lids stuck around their necks. You know, they're going in there now for people food. Zen Makarski says a wildlife manager who used to work in this area once showed him proof that elk were developing a taste for junk food. So she rolls down her window and there's 12, in my, in my recollection, 10 to 12 elk bedded down. I mean, completely lying on the ground. And she pulls out a bag of chips, shakes them up and down, and every single elk there stood up and walked towards us. Animals can figure things out. They don't need us to put hay and, and things like that, pellets in their yard for them. You know, that's what I hear a lot. You know, I have to feed them, they need my help, they need this. You know, and I, I just like to say, stop it. You know, this is not an act of selflessness, it's an act of selfishness. This is not about helping wildlife, this is about wanting to see wildlife. And we've had many, many cases where that act of wanting to see wildlife has led in horrible just horrible, disastrous results for the animals. Makarski is the public information officer for the Game and Fish Regional Office in Kingman. He's constantly spreading the word that feeding wildlife is bad news for both animals and people. Well, the bottom line for me is that humans and wildlife just don't interact real well together. You bring them in and they're facing all kinds of dangers when we draw them into the community. People are not doing them a favor. He says it raises their risk of being hit by a car. Plus, an artificially high concentration of animals makes it easier to spread disease, and Makarski says it's like ringing the dinner bell for predators. You're creating potential type of smorgasbord for a predatory animal. You know, when these mountain lions are coming in here and feeding on the deer and the elk that are within this community, then you've got a dangerous predator within the community. And when predators get used to people, they often become a risk to public safety. You know, when we have an animal like a bear or a mountain lion that has become a danger to society and we have to remove that animal from the wild, we're the ones as wildlife managers that have to dispatch that animal. And we do it as humanely as possible, of course, but there's nothing worse 
that taking an otherwise healthy animal and having to put it down, we wouldn't have had to if people hadn't been feeding those animals and bringing them into their communities. We would never have had to put those animals down. People love wild animals, but sometimes they love them to death. That familiar phrase, a fed bear is a dead bear, is more than just a cute saying. It's a serious reminder that the actions people take can lead to terrible consequences for wildlife. And unfortunately, it seems to be a message we have to keep constantly repeating because unfortunately, sometimes they don't listen and we tend to see the same issues over and over again. Well, that's our show for tonight. Hope you enjoyed it. For more information, visit our website at azgfd.gov. For all the fine folks at Arizona Game and Fish, I'm Jim Paxson. We'll see you next time.